Good evening. Welcome to Fire Safe Marin's webinar series. My name is Rich Shortall, Fire Safe Marin Executive Coordinator. So tonight, for the first time, I have a co-host. I'm happy to introduce Roberta McIntyre from our very close partners, the Sonoma Fire Council. Roberta, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, um, I have like 35 plus years in the fire service. I started out as a volunteer at Roseland in Santa Rosa area, then became a career firefighter for the city of Santa Rosa. Did that, evolved into fire prevention, eventually became the count, Sonoma County's fire marshal. That's where I got engaged with Fire Safe Sonoma. The, and Fire Safe Sonoma is Sonoma County's countywide Fire Safe Council. We've been around for nearly 25 years now, not quite as long as Fire Safe Marin, but um, we were meant to be patterned after Fire Safe Marin when our forefathers created Fire Safe Sonoma. And I've been um, chair of Fire Safe Sonoma since 2008, actually, when I became the county fire marshal. I eventually became the president and CEO of Fire Safe Sonoma. And um, yeah, so that's where I'm at and a little bit about me. Thanks, Rich. Great. Thanks, Robert. It's great to have you here. We do work very closely with uh, our partners up there. And we were talking about um, the fact that everybody has a lot of interest in the safety of pets and large animals and whatnot. So we thought, why not try to do something together? So we're excited about that tonight. So the Fire Safe webinar series, it is generally created by the members of our educational committee includes representatives of fire agencies, environmental groups, UC Marin master gardeners, and various subject matter experts. Very importantly, the project is funded by the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. Before I introduce tonight's guest, I wanna let you know that we have several interesting webinars coming up. In July, we're gonna focus on fire insurance concerns of homeowners. And in August, we'll be speaking with members of the Marin Center for Independent Living about the impact of disaster on the access and functional needs community. So tonight, as guests and speakers, we're fortunate to have Captain Cindy Machado from the Marine Humane Society and Julie Atwood from Sonoma's Halter Project. They're gonna to talk to us about how you can keep your pets and large animals safe during a disaster. We strongly encourage you, all of you to participate tonight by providing questions in writing through that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Questions that can't be addressed during tonight's conversation will be answered and posted on the Fire Safe Marin website. And we do ask that you please keep your questions related to tonight's topic. Tonight's presentation will be recorded and available on the Fire Safe Marin YouTube channel, which includes a lot of very interesting wildfire educational videos. After tonight's presentations, we'll have a little roundtable discussion and an opportunity to ask some follow-up and additional questions of our presenters. So that said, let's get started by introducing Captain Cindy Machado. Cindy? Hi, Rich. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for letting us talk about animals tonight. So I'm going to do a really quick screen share my presentation. So let's bring that up real quick. Okay, hopefully you can all see my presentation. It's a joy to be here with all of you, whether you're tuning in live or watching the recording. Thank you for taking time out of your day to learn about evacuating safely with pets and animals. It's my pleasure to be here. I've been with Marin Humane for 37 years and I've seen my share of disasters and how people respond to them with pets. So we're gonna give you a really quick snapshot view of how to handle being prepared for especially a wildfire in Marin and Sonoma. The most important component for you to remember is that you know your animal best. I might have a good idea about breed behaviors or certain individual animals when I see them, but I may not know everything that you know. And so really remember to use that to your advantage, whether you're evacuating, handing your animal off to a boarding or emergency animal shelter facility, just remember that you know how that animal is gonna react better than anyone. You will also be really skilled at knowing what your pet may need or want. They may be two separate worlds for your animal's um, sake, but for your sake, the more you know about how your animal will respond to a disaster, how they'll respond to stress, the more you can plan to be able to include those items that your pet will really appreciate. Most importantly, if you do nothing else tonight, please take heed of our advice of being prepared for wildfire. 
wildfires are fast. We don't often have a lot of time. So if you can prepare in advance a kit designed for all of your pet's needs and then practice it and stay informed, you're already gonna be ahead of most people. Um, I'm really encouraged at how uh, Marin residents have really done a great job preparing for their animals. In some cases, more planning for their animals than themselves, but it's all a really good uh, first step. So disaster kits for pets are really simple. You do not need to go out and buy something. You can build your own really simply. There are really great ways to get free supplies, free carriers, free crates. But just we want you to have about a two week supply of whatever your pet will need. If your pet is on special medications, we want to make sure you have an ample supply of those and at least remember to write down what those medications are, because often we find people may forget what their pet is on. Having a photograph of your pet is always helpful. Um, I love to include something that your pet will remind themselves of you. So a nice worn t-shirt at the end of the day is a great thing to add to your pet's carrier. Um, it gives them some sense that you're around them. Their favorite toy, toys and treats, of course, uh, but there are a lot of checklists as well available on websites, our website, FireSafe's website. And we really want to make it simple for you, but we also want to emphasize you do not have to spend a lot of money to be prepared to have your pet ready to go. We talk a little bit about behaviors during a disaster. This is really important because if you have cats like mine, you might be challenged to be able to find them on any given day, whereas your dog may see your suitcase and get really excited. So just really kind of know what your pet can expect. If it's an indoor pet, I'd really urge you to consider knowing where their hiding spots are. Are they under the bed? Are they in the closet? Are they behind the headboard that we can't get to? Um, and if they're outdoors, maybe consider bringing them into a smaller area, maybe a small room in your house, a shed, somewhere accessible so that you do have to leave your property, they're right there waiting for you. Be mindful of those animals that you may have in your life that are nocturnal. Uh, they may wanna be sleeping when you're out moving about and whatever we can do to help ease their stress, just be mindful of you know, their sleeping patterns, their behavior patterns and so forth. I can tell you, I do not have any cats in my life that see a suitcase and get excited. <laughs> so if you have a cat that wants to curl up in your suitcase, great job. We want to make it as fun for our animals as possible and not meaning that when they see the animal crate, it's a trip to the veterinarian. So knowing all these behaviors in advance will really go far to help you. You will probably have to modify some of your pet's behaviors, especially with regard to desensitizing them to being in a carrier or a crate. And this is really, really important because they may be spending hours and days on end in temporary confinement during a disaster. So the more familiar they are with, with a crate, being safe in a crate, being happy in a crate, that will help you. It's not necessarily going to be a bad experience where they have to go to the veterinarian. Um, so use treats, use your scented t-shirt, whatever you can to make it a happy place. I put the fire alarm there just to, because at one time I had three indoor only cats who were all trained and desensitized to the fire alarm that I tested every month. And so once a month, all three cat carriers were placed in the living room. I'd test the fire um, alarm and then they'd all go running into their crates for a treat. That's the ideal animal household. I wish I had that these days. Uh, but for many of you, I'm sure you do. So just be mindful that we want to make it orderly. We want to be planning well in advance uh, before we actually have to leave. Uh, I also had a really fun experience recently where I had to do a road trip up to the state of Washington with a dog that um, I currently own, Phil. He's pictured here. And he probably hadn't been in a car for more than two hours max. And I was going to be faced with a you know, 12 to 13 hour drive, hotels, all of the things that come with traveling. So I realized at the time, this was a great way for me to practice. Um, as you can see on the photo, he was happily asleep just about every moment we were actually traveling on the road. Uh, he had a nice, comfortable car seat. He had all of his favorite toys. He had access to water. He had a chill mat. I really did my best to prepare. 
And it was really a relief because he not only got through it, but he really enjoyed it. Even being in a strange hotel room, uh, he, he was just right at home. So the more we can practice, use these opportunities, whether it's a weekend trip or a day trip, uh, this is all practice for uh, disaster planning. Identification is the number one thing that I really want to emphasize tonight, whether it's a cat, a dog, or any other animal. This is our best attempt to get them back to you in a, you know, hopefully quick time. And when I say identification, I mean tags that show your ownership, a license for your dog, and in some cases, a microchip tag. Uh, the, the three tags that you see listed here are just that, a license, a microchip, and an owner ID tag. The only tag that's gonna do your neighbors any good is that owner ID tag that actually has your phone number and your address. We really wanna make sure that your pets are wearing as much identification as possible, including cats. They have safety collars, so they won't get snagged if they roam outdoors. You might have to go through a few collars and tags, but please identify them. And we. We're happy to provide free pet ID tags here at Marin Humane for anyone that needs them. Microchipping is also really, really important. Uh, this is our best uh, tool of the trade in animal sheltering to enable you to get your pet back quickly. It's permanent, which prevents animals from being lost or stolen, it comes back to you. This was a cat named Lily who actually, her owners moved to Florida. She was outdoors when they had to leave. They left her behind because they had to go. They placed lost reports or found lost reports with us. Believe it or not, three years later, Lily popped up in the animal shelter with her microchip, which enabled us to contact them in Florida. They came all the way out from Florida um, and re reunited with her very happily. So microchipping is simple. We offer it for free at Marin Humane. You can call, uh, have your dog or cat or rabbit chipped and then you have the satisfaction of knowing that it's going to be there permanently. Make sure you update your records. If we do it, we'll have your information in our database, but please make sure if you move or change phone numbers that we're alerted to that. Temporary housing options for pets during an emergency come in all shapes and sizes. We really recommend that you find an option before an event uh, with a relative, friend, someone out of the area. That's an agreement between you and the person. But if you can't do that, then look for pet friendly hotels. A lot of people were really successful uh, last year with Airbnb rentals, especially with pets. That's probably the new up and coming modern way of finding um, uh, rentals when we need to. Pet boarding, especially in Marin and veterinary hospitals are really, really limited. And if you have a relationship now with your veterinary hospital or a boarding facility, take advantage of, of finding out what their plan is. If they will have uh, space, make sure your animals are up to date on your vaccination to be able to get you in there. <laughs> and if not, there's plenty of emergency housing options for pets. Marin Humane and all the other animal shelters in the region accept pets from emergency situations and offer free boarding and we'll hold your pet for as long as you need us to. This is the reality of temporary emergency pet sheltering. They're most likely going to be in a wire cage or crate. Sometimes they'll be in an actual shelter run similar to a boarding kennel, uh, but it's really bare necessities. I, I always wanna just emphasize that your pet is safe but it's not your home and not your couch. That's why if you can find your own arrangements before needing this kind of service, it's always a benefit to your animal. The other thing I've really been impressed with in Marin is our community's preparedness level with disasters of all types, but mainly around animals. So we want you to have your own plan to start with, make sure it includes everything your pet will need possible options if you have to leave your neighborhood, and then make sure you can identify what resources are there in your neighborhood that could help you during um, an event or an emergency. Maybe there's someone very animal savvy in your neighborhood that, that you can call on. And then once you've identified those two areas, offer help if you can provide it. And this is really um, wonderful to see in Marin neighborhoods. 
that have really helped do a lot of planning. Probably the other most important tip that I can tell you is become a weather watcher. Uh, red flag warning days, they mean business as we all know. That would be the day that you'd wanna make sure all of your animals are rounded up. If that outdoor cat is, is around, put them in the bathroom overnight, have your cars packed and ready to go. And it's your comfort zone of how long you stay there. But we really wanna watch the weather. We wanna know where the wind's going. We wanna make sure that we're getting notifications and alerts. When you get a notification to evacuate, do so quickly. Um, there's all kinds of things that make getting out easy for you, whether it's folding carriers, backpacks, wheeled bags, um, all of these things you can practice and plan around, but don't stay if you're asked to evacuate. We will be there to help the animals after the fire, just as when it starts before the fire. We will go into evacuated areas to remove pets. We will go into evacuated areas to provide food, water, um, and veterinary care. Uh, for animals, it's a long-term support function. So well after the fire is over, we will be helping pets for months and months and months. So it's really important that if you can't get to your animal, know that Marin County has a very solid plan that we will go in and, and get your pet the help he or she needs, or in some cases, remo remove your pet, bring them back to our shelter to reunite with you. I'm gonna share this video. This is a really happy ending to, to end my presentation on, uh, featuring a dog that was missing from the Sonoma County fires a number of years ago, and the microchip hadn't been updated. It, it gives you the story, but I wanna emphasize, if you do ever lose your pet, Never, never give up. So I'll play it for you now. Hey, guys. It's always so much fun to see the chaos of a happy reunion, more so than the chaos of a disaster scene. I'm available to all of you. Here's my email. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. Uh, it's my direct phone number as well. I'm happy to help anyone anytime for anything that uh, they need on the disaster front. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and give it back to Rich for a moment. Well, thanks so much, Cindy. That was great. and. Uh heartwarming uh, video at the end, that reunification was fantastic. If that isn't a lesson, everybody, be sure your pets are ID'd, way important. So we have some really good questions from the audience. The first one is, uh, a person has a large amount of animals, three dogs and five cats, and wants to know if a hotel can refuse you a room during an evacuation if you have too many animals. Ah, that's a good question, and it's a hard dilemma to have. The fact of the matter is, yes, the hotel, they all have their individual rules. I always like to say, how good of a negotiator are you on your animal's behalf? During an emergency, I always tend to see the kindness of businesses. And I will just think positive that if you're responsible and you're coming across as such, most hotels are gonna accommodate you, especially if you have a carrier for each individual animal. Um, that will ensure that the hotel won't have to worry as much, but it does vary. Thank you, Cindy. You know, I, I think you can't stress enough the importance of carriers. And I think your instruction on how to get uh, your pet used to your carrier, that was really very clever with the uh, fire alarm and the treat, but really makes a big difference when, when, when you're trying to deal with this. Okay, um, Roberta, you wanna take the next question? Sure, so um, real quick, a follow-up on the hotel thing though. 
I would also recommend do some work pre-planning ahead of time and pick out some hotels where you're likely to go and check with them ahead of time and, and see what arrangements you can make. And then, so the second question is, um, do shelters where people are housed in a disaster allow families to bring their dogs? And I think in Marin County as well as Sonoma County, you can bring your small pets if they're crated, but what happens if you have you know, a large amount of, of pets or you know, what are the issues with shelters and housing your pets when you bring them? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thanks for bringing that up. So if it's a Red Cross shelter, generally speaking, Red Cross does not allow animals other than service animals. Where it differs is if it's a county or city run or even some private human shelters that make the decision to allow pets. So for instance, Marin County is very pet savvy. We may not allow the pet to be in with, with the people in the shelters, but they will be right adjoining them. Um, it, they're hard to manage. Sonoma County, you guys have the wonderful ability to cohabitate people and their pets at the fairgrounds, and it's worked beautifully. That is the model that we're trying to get across the country because it just makes more sense. The animals are calm, the people are calm, but it's a work in progress. So I would never assume that a county human shelter will allow you to bring in your animals. That's why you have to have a plan. Great, thanks, Cindy. Are there ways for people to volunteer um, to help Marine Humane or other people at the shelters with the animal management? Yes, so we'd love to get them in our volunteer base well ahead of the disaster, especially right now. We lost a lot of volunteers during COVID. So if you're interested in volunteering, go on our website. During a disaster, we use our own trained volunteers. We have a variety of different job functions, but if you're interested in that, best thing is to sign up well before the disaster. Great. Yeah, I see another question in here about medications. So Cindy, mm -hmm. you know, we all try to take enough medications for our pets as part of our plan, but what happens if we run out of the medications for our pets? Yeah, and interesting, that question actually happened during the first power shutoff events where people didn't have medication, they forgot the name of the medication, there was no electricity to, for veterinary hospitals to use um, computer records. So the, the rule of thumb is talk to your veterinarian because they're the dispensing entity and they will be able to tell you how to have a prescription on hand in an emergency um, as well as having a supply so you don't run up, similar to how we do human medicine. But in the event that all of that's gone, Marin Humane will be the coordinating animal entity for all veterinary care during a disaster. And so that's why it's important for us to know what medication your pet's on. So our veterinary teams will be able to hopefully um, fill those prescriptions and get that pet back on its medication. Good news. <laughs> um, I think one of the words you used earlier was that you should include enrichment for the pets. Um, can you clarify what that means? Yeah, so enrichment is a way of keeping your animal happy. For my dog, Phil, he has to have his elephant toy. Nothing else matters to him but his little squeaky elephant toy. toy. Go figure. But for some other animals, it might be a peanut butter or cheese filled Kong toy, or it might be the scent of their human on a t-shirt or it might be a catnip mouse for our kitties that are stuck in a carrier. It might be um, cat grass, not the legal kind, but you know, wheat grass, oat grass is great for cats. It really soothes their needs. So whatever your animal likes that makes them happy, that's a, what we use as enrichment to um, make them happy. It can be scents, it can be sounds, it can be um, actual play toys, food, uh, all different types. I'm, Great I'm recommendation. Laughing, <laughs> laughing right now, Cindy, because um, while you were doing your presentation, my dog brought his squeaky toy over for enrichment. He says, hey, the work <laughs> is over. It's time to play. Yeah, so, that's exactly. We depend on that for our own entertainment sometimes. Yeah. Might hear him squeak. So one last question, and I think this is a big concern for people. So what happens if the, if the uh, resident is not home during a disaster and the pet is and you can't get back back into the neighborhood's been closed and the pet's stuck there what happens to the animal 
So our trained officers have access to evacuated zones when they're safe. So not while fire is burning all around, but when it's deemed to be safe enough to go into these neighborhoods, you know, days afterwards, if you call, we'll have a hotline set up or our main emergency number. Our officers will go and actually remove animals with your permission from their house. So if you want us to use your house key, we'll take your key, we'll go in your house, we'll find your animal. Sometimes it's just to go check on animals to make sure that they're safe and sound. So we'll leave food and water for them and keep them in your house. So each case is different, but the most important part is call your, our animal shelter in that event. You know, we use our database to know where the pets are, for instance, so we can bring up every licensed dog in a neighborhood and we'll use those records to make sure that you know, we're in touch with people or if there are animals that may have been left behind or you're at work. Um, that's our big deal during a disaster. We spend most of our time in that aftermath going into those zones and, and caring for pets. Well, if, that's a if we don't have permission and we know an animal has been there for days, we can go through a window or go through a door. So we will make entry if we have to, but we never want to do that unless it's absolutely needed. Yeah. That's a tremendous service. Thank you for doing that. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Cindy. Well, Cindy, we'll be back when we do our roundtable shortly. Um, so right now, let's uh, bring on Julie Atwood. Julie? Thanks, Rich. And thank you to Marin M. Sonoma Fire Safe Council's Rich and Roberta and your teams for inviting us to um, be able to share this with people. It's, it's so important and it's just great to be with all of you and such amazing professionals. And for me, it's like a reunion because I get to be um, sharing this information with really good friends, Captain Cindy Machado and Roberta McIntyre, neither of whom I've seen in person for about 17 months. So this is, uh, this is actually an extra treat. So we are going to be talking about the large animals and uh, give me just a minute and I'm going to um, do something here. I want you to take a look for a minute at this um, beautiful montage we have, lots and lots of animals. This is just a snapshot of the many species that we are blessed to be living with and which are part of our lives and our landscapes here in the North Bay especially Sonoma and Marin counties. And so I'm going to talk to you and try to touch on the high points, the things that we think are most important for people to know. Now I'm gonna preface this by saying that of course, both Cindy and Roberta have covered a number of things that um, I'll touch on very, very briefly because we have commonalities. Obviously large animals come with their own special challenges and I like to say that whether you're uh, evacuating or preparing to shelter in place your cattle, your llamas, your sheep, your goats, your cats, your chickens, your guardian dogs, getting out of the house with your animals, getting out of the ranch with your animals is kind of like getting away with your older or very young or possibly less able or challenged family members, it is going to take longer. So let's start with how do you plan? Evacuating and sheltering in place require planning. And you've heard it from Cindy and you've heard it from Rich and you've heard it from Roberta. So how to prepare? Well, the most important message I have for everyone here is this, whether you're planning to evacuate or whether you think that sheltering in place is going to be best for the animals that you have to take care of, you absolutely have to have more than one plan. You have to have a plan for every possible disaster and eventuality that you can think of. And you have to have a backup, have a plan A, a plan B and a plan C. I can't say it enough times. So moving on, let's talk about your evacuation plan. Planning for animal evacuations really starts with assessing the risks and not just the obvious risks that are related to uh, your property itself. But if your plan is to evacuate and that's absolutely what you wanna do, then A, you need to know when to go, be paying absolute attention to those alerts and know when you are going to begin to be at risk 
and that's the time to go. Think about the animals that you're evacuating. A lot of the properties that we have in these counties have lots of rescues. We're blessed with kind-hearted people who take in animals that have special needs. Can those animals, the elders, the, the seniors, the oldies, the ones who are lame or crippled, can they actually be loaded safely? Can they be transported safely? Can they deal with the stresses of a shelter or temporary housing? Some hard questions that you have to ask yourself. How long will it take you to load them? Everything's gonna take longer. I like to say that evacuating with large animals is a lot like Ginger Rogers. She did everything that Fred did, but she did it backwards and in heels. And that's kind of what your large animal evacuation is gonna look like. It's going to take longer and you need to practice, practice, practice. Make sure that everyone loads, make sure that they will load for a variety of people in a variety of trailers. And if they don't, then switch to your shelter in place plan and make sure that everybody has the safest possible place at home. How many rigs and helpers would you need to get everybody out? And how long will that take? These are just a few, but I think some of the most important questions. Next slide, next slide, Shiloh. Know where you'll go and who will help you. So again, you heard Cindy talk about the challenges around sheltering. Well, everything she said about small animals is multiplied 20 times when we're looking at large animals. First, the emergency animal shelters will not be open until an emergency or a disaster is declared. Often by that time, it's almost too late to be evacuating safely for a bunch of reasons. In the North Bay, those large animal shelters fill up very, very, very fast. You need to rely on your personal resource network. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of starting now if you don't have a little black book that really is an address book, in addition to your cell phone, in addition to your important document binder that has, again, more than one, more than two, more than three of every type of resource, every type of, of helper from someone to help you catch your animals and load them to someone to get you an extra trailer and a truck or a driver if you're not able to drive yours and places to go. Ideally, as far out of the area as you can get to a place that you know is going to be safe from whatever is taking place, whether it's a fire, um, an uh, incoming storm. And if you are forced into a shelter in place situation, let's say we have an earthquake and you're not going anywhere, then you need to know what your personal resources are. So lots of, lots of things to think about. Next slide. Animal evacuation prep. Again, continuing on because it's a really important, important topic. And again, we're talking about the big animals here. Um, what are some of, the, some of the additional things to take into consideration? First, catch those animals up and contain them so they're easy to catch and load. This is the big animal version of locking your cat in the bathroom. Get them up into a place where you're going to be able to find them if it's dark, if it's windy, if it's muddy, and you're not going to have to run out to the back 40 and hunt them up and catch them. Make sure that all of your supplies, your ready equipment, your animal go kits, your personal go kits are already loaded. You don't have time to be throwing them into the truck. Make sure that your rigs, those are your trucks and trailers, your SUVs, Everything that you're using to get yourselves and your animals out are fueled up. The old rule of thumb used to be at least half a tank. Well, what the heck? We've all experienced gas shortages, um, extended power outages, just add to that exponentially. So start with a full tank. When there's a red flag, when there's a storm warning, your rig should be checked. The tires should be checked. You should go through your truck and trailer safety checklist. You should have a full tank of gas, it should be hooked up, and it should be staged facing out, ready to go. And make sure your trailers are clean. And if we're talking about a potential fire environment, that means no bedding. Don't put fresh shavings in the bottom of your trailer. And make sure that when you leave, the windows are closed. 
open windows with livestock and equines during a, a, a high wind event. Smoke, ashes, embers are a big danger. So clean the trailers out, nothing on the floor that can burn and the windows closed when you hit the road. Last but definitely not least is your PPE, your personal protective equipment. If you're not safe, you can't take care of anybody else, including your animals. So make sure that your PPE are on the front seat of your truck. And that means your headlamp, your gloves, you're wearing your work boots and your long pants and a long sleeve shirt, but make sure that everything you're going to need and everyone who's with you is right there so that you've got it and you'll stay safe. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about sheltering your animals in place. This is a topic that scares the living daylights out of most people, but it is a reality of life in California. Often, if we're talking about fire, your large animals may be safest at home, at their home, especially if you have taken all of the fire safe precautions to make your property and the animals refuge as safe and defensible as it can possibly be. Having a shelter in place plan is also critically important because there are times when that may be the only option. You can't get the animals out, no one can get in. Uh, and again, fires aren't the only situation that we may be facing here in California. And there can be times when we're not going to be able to get animals out. So what are some considerations? How do you determine if your animals will be safe enough at your property? Well, here are some of the high points. Is their home defensible? Everything that makes your home and property safe is going to make their home safe. Is it irrigated or do you have a really dry, dry, dry lot pasture like the photo here with my horses out in their bone dry summer hills with really nice uh, fireproof steel fencing? How far from a radiant heat source are those animals going to be? Their pasture may be safe and there may be nothing to burn, but if they are close to a heavily forested or very brushy area or some big barns or even a densely populated uh, residential area, that could be a hazard that you need to think about. And again, make sure that that perimeter fencing is safe and secure. It's not going to burn. And if it's a hot wire, if it's an electric fence, make sure that you've got some backup power to keep it going. Next slide. I should let you guys know that um, my partner Shiloh is actually up in Oregon and she's participating in this uh, program with me and that's who's advancing my slides. I meant to introduce her earlier. So thanks Shiloh. Just how safe is your property? Well, we've got great tools, fire safe councils, our CAL FIRE Ready, Set, Go, Ready for Wildfire app. Both of these resources have incredible checklists, videos, walk around self-assessments that will help you take a hard look at your property and make sure that it's safe. Making it safe means that it's accessible after a fire or an earthquake. Making it safe means it's going to be safe for our responders so they can get in and do their work. It means that you're maintaining defensible space, including the height of the trees and clearance for those emergency vehicles to get into your property. If they can't get into your property, they cannot get into the area that the animals are housed. And in the case of our animal disaster response teams, they're not going to be able to get in to either evacuate your animals or provide them with welfare checks, something that we do and which I'm happy to talk about if there are questions. Consider every possibility. Have a hard look around your property. Consider every potential hazard. Um, airdrops are something to think about. And that picture of that tree there on the left, that's my ranch, my driveway between my house and my barn right after the 2017 Nuns Fire, which started about 300 yards from my back door. So we were pretty prepared. We had lots of tools. Our, our vehicles were all in a safe place, but we could not get past all the trees that were blocking us from the primary container that had all our big tools like our chainsaws and our fuel for the chainsaws and things like that. So we had to hike through our vineyard uh, over a lot of rubble and debris in order to get 
to the tools that we needed to clear our roads so responders could get in. So uh, that's something that we took a, a much closer look at in the last several years. And I'm encouraging you to do the same. Just look at your property through a really, really harsh lens. Next slide. Disaster action plan. Do you have one? If you do, it's time to update it. If you don't, it's time to make one. Your disaster action plan includes all of your emergency contacts. It includes photos, ID, registration documents for your animals, including photos of you with your animals, your microchip registration information, your vet records, prescriptions, dosage information. You don't wanna have to be relying on your brain when you're tired and you're stressed to remember what and when are my animals needing their meds. An advanced care directive. It's nothing that we like thinking about, but if you and your animals are separated and someone else needs to make decisions about their care, it's really a huge sense of relief and security to know that that document exists and your plans for your animals will be carried out. And we have samples and templates and all kinds of resources that support all of these tasks, everything on our to-do list at our website, halterproject.org. And Marin Humane also has loads and loads of great information, including info about barnyard livestock. Uh, one other thing to think about now, when we're talking about our disaster action plans, we really need to factor in those extended power outages. They may not be the result directly of a disaster, but we are going to be experiencing them, we know, more frequently, and they're going to last longer. And that can be a disaster if you don't have enough water storage, if your fences are electric and you don't have solar backup. So plan for that extended power outage, whether it's a planned outage or whether it it is brought on by whatever the disaster is, that is a secondary disaster that can actually be more harmful than the fire or the storm itself. And your plan had better include every single solitary thing that you need to take care of your animals if you're without power for an extended period. Next slide. Help responders help your animals. There are simple ways to do this. Um, here on this slide, we've given you a couple of examples. On the left, we've got a simple whiteboard. Take a piece of um, white painted metal, go out to Staples and get a whiteboard. List the critical details about every animal that might be on your property, where they are, where their feet is located, special needs. It's nice to include their name and a little bit of information about them, including their sex. If you have animals left behind for whatever reason and you need to get help for them, this is of enormous benefit to responders. I myself am an animal disaster responder. I do deploy to um, big incidents and have for a number of years now. And even though we have excellent detailed information that our call takers on the hotlines take from people calling in and requesting help, it is incredibly helpful to come to a location and find something like this waiting for us to take a look at. If sheriff's deputies or marine humane or firefighters are on your property and they see something like this, then they may, if they can, take a few minutes and have a look around. And if they see animals that they think might be in distress, then they'll put a call in to um, the animal welfare agency in that jurisdiction in Marin, it's gonna be Marin Humane in Sonoma, it's gonna be Sonoma County Animal Services and they'll make sure that the animals get the care and attention they need. So a really simple but enormously helpful tool that can make a huge difference. Next slide. Provide info about the resources and the animals to the responders. So again, a really simple tool like just taking a Google Earth aerial photo of your property and then putting in a key, to show them where the animals might be, where are the resources, where's the water, um, where might they be able to draft from, where are hydrants? All of these things are of a huge benefit to the animals and the animal responders because 
if we know that there is water on that property, we don't have to spend extra time and a lot of energy trying to find a way to haul water in. Maybe we can't get a water trailer in. Um, we spend a lot of time hauling five gallon water cans very long distances to water animals. Also, it's really important to let responders know where the hazardous materials are so that again, they can keep an eye out for where those animals might be, especially if the fences are down. All of this is part of what makes your property safer and defensible. And it's all part of what should be in your animal disaster plan for your equines and your livestock. Next slide. Red flags and other alerts. Cindy did a great job talking about knowing when to go. Know when to go. Know what those alerts mean. What those alerts mean, and by all means, make sure that you are signed up for every possible alert that's provided in your area. So, if you don't know what's coming, you're not going to be preparing far enough in advance. Prep your animals before you need to go. And again, prepping for large animals means that when there is a fire weather watch or a big storm warning, that's when you really need to be thinking about going, not when an evacuation of warning or advisory is issued and definitely don't wait until an evacuation order is issued. Do not wait to evacuate. It's often going to be too late and you've just increased your risks exponentially. Make sure that your animals have visible ID on them, even if they're microchipped. Now, uh, now is the time to move them to that confined, easily accessible pen, corral, or arena where they're going to be safe. And make sure that you've got good halters and good lead ropes for everybody where the animals are and also extras. Um, we had um, an incident just down the road for me in 2017 where we had a fabulous equine uh, performing group. They travel all over the world. They all have their halters firmly attached to the bars right outside their stalls. In that gigantic traumatic wind event, the Porta stall barn collapsed and they couldn't get any of the halters. These were actually Liberty horses and they managed to load 22 Liberty horses in their gigantic van using voice cues. So an amazing lesson in um, working with your animals, knowing your animals, gaining that trust and having a plan. Next slide. Supplies, just a few of the must haves. Uh, definitely make sure that you know how much water you're going to need for every animal. We have a little handy chart here on the side. We have all this information on our website, as does Marin Humane. They've got a great pamphlet you can pick up. It tells you exactly how much food and how much water for just about every species we have in our counties. Make sure that you have water for at least 10 to 12 days, preferably more, and feed for at least three to five days ideally more. Medications, Cindy's already touched on that. You need to have backup. You need to know that you can access your medications and your prescription if necessary. And it is tricky. You do need to enlist the help of your vet to make sure that you've got all your medication needs taken care of. Make sure that you have your own buckets, especially when you're evacuating. Muck buckets, water buckets, long hoses, good nozzles, shovels, and brooms. You don't want to risk contaminating, um, spreading disease to your animals or anyone else's by sharing. It's nice when someone offers you their hose, but it's not a great idea. So make sure that your supplies at home and on the road include all of those things. Slow feed hay nets, really important if you have equines. We have really detailed, complete checklists for equines, farm animals, all, all kinds of species on our website. There's way, way, way more than we could cover here. So if you need it, um, you know where to find it. Next slide. Sheltering in place prep. Again, remove those masks, wraps, and halters. Really important. Increase the water storage add tanks, add troughs, and here's something people often don't think about, 
secure those troughs so they can't be tipped over. Animals like to play in their water. It's nice if they have a nice cool place to stand, but it's even better if that water is available for them to drink. Relocate all the hay, the bedding, anything that can burn, including, you know, that cozy sofa that hangs outside your barn. Move everything as far away from the animals as possible. Add visible identification and make sure that you've taken your animals out of barns and sheds. The rule is turn them out, but don't turn them loose and close the gates and the doors behind them because animals will run back into that building. Even though we know it's not safe to them, that's their, their safe place where they're fed and where, there's, where they sleep. So please turn them out, don't turn them loose, close the doors behind them. Next slide. Finally, resources. We have loads of resources on Marin Humane site and at halterproject.org. And I wanted to let you know just a couple of other great resources for our large animals. If we're talking about companion animals, so these are our large uh, four-legged or, or feathered pets who are companions just as our dogs and our cats are, then Marin Humane and Sonoma County Animal Services are going to be your go-to resources. We also are blessed with a number of community animal response teams in the North Bay, and I've listed Sonoma and Napa here because those are the two most likely to be responding in a declared disaster, and we have information with all the hotline and helpline numbers in the North Bay if you find yourself in a situation where you need help for your animals. If we're talking about commercial livestock, that's a different model and we have amazing resources for those as well. Most notably, our agricultural commissioners, our departments of ag and our rock star UC Extension Service Dairy and Rangeland Advisors. We're very fortunate in Sonoma and Marin, we share um, ag advisors. And so both of those people work together. Many of our farmers and ranchers have ranches in both counties. So again, we're kind of closing out with a little glimpse of just a few of the animals that are so near and dear to our hearts. Um, people come from all over the world to enjoy the beauty and the pastoral lifestyle that we enjoy here. But along with that comes the responsibility of planning for our animals. And just like Cindy, we are here at the Halter Project to help you with training if you'd like to become a volunteer, with resources, you can spend some time with us. We have uh, close to a dozen preparedness videos and our website includes presentations by some of the world's leading experts on animal emergency and disaster preparedness and response. My last message for all of you is breathe, keep calm and be ready for whatever. You'll find that preparation is going to be the most relaxing thing that you can do. And we're here to help you get there. Thanks for joining us. Look forward to your questions. Well, Julie, that was just fantastic. I, each time I hear you speak, I really learned so much. We had a, for the audience, we had a, a rehearsal and I go, wow, I didn't know any of this stuff. And once again, we're going through tonight and I, it was just amazing. I can't thank you enough. Uh, do have a couple of questions for you. Um, one is who helps uh, the pets or large, large animals inside evacuation zones? Would you like me to take that question? Sure, please. Okay, um, so the answer to that, I'm not sure you guys can see me here, but um, the answer to that is usually if we're talking about pets in a mandatory evacuation situation during an ongoing event, that is going to be the authorized animal response resources who are working with the agency that has the jurisdictions for the animals. So that's a whole lot of government ease, but it's important to know because every jurisdiction, every county, including Marin and Sonoma have somewhat different protocols. So as Cindy explained earlier, in Marin County, you're really fortunate for all companion animals, Marin Humane is your go-to resource and Marin Humane will be coordinating 
all of the care and uh, care shelter and evacuation needs for all of the animals for which they have been requested to help or have identified. In Sonoma County, Sonoma County Animal Services will be relying on its mutual aid partners. And I am just so thrilled that Marine Humane is one of those resources and has been there for us in Sonoma County time and time again. But in Sonoma County, we do have a community animal response team. The community animal response team is activated by the county, by the office of, or the Department of Emergency Management in a declared disaster. So they can go in during an ongoing disaster when it's safe and check on animals. Um, I'm actually a member of that team as well as six others. We, um, we perform welfare checks. We'll go in with veterinarians. We have another great resource in the University of California Veterinary Emergency Response Team, who is available to many of our jurisdictions in disasters. Um, animal control officers or humane officers are an enormous resource and they're often the first in. So that there is no one simple answer in terms of who these resources are, but the good news is that we have a lot of them and the number of people who are training as volunteers to be those resources is growing exponentially. We have information on our website, by the way, for people who are interested in becoming a volunteer animal disaster responder. Great, I think we have time for one more question before we go to the round table, Roberta. Yeah, so let's say I get overwhelmed or don't have enough staff in the middle of an emergency and I have more animals than I can deal with myself. Is there, rather than calling 911 and saying, hey, help, is there a quick go-to number or somebody we can call for help? Uh, Roberta, is that a trick question? So, uh, what, unfortunately, one of the slides I had to take out because I talked too long is who, who to call, how to get help. So, uh, we do have all that information available. And if someone would like a list, a printed list of all the animal helplines in the North Bay that are activated once an emergency is declared in that county. Um, those are the numbers that you really need to keep in your phone because 911 will be overwhelmed and they're generally only going to be responding to human life safety issues. So you're going to need to call the animal helpline or hotline as Cindy said earlier. Um, during the early hours of a disaster, Usually, you, we're not going to be able to get resources inside fire lines or um, in a slide or quake because it's just not safe. So again, we really urge people to develop that personal resource network. Find out who can help you move your animals, transport your animals. And again, we have lists of resources and suggestions, and we're happy to help you personally. Uh, we can also do a workshop for your neighborhood or your barn. So there are resources during the incident and as it wears on, and you're going to reach those by calling the animal helpline. Great. Well, um, we're getting right close to seven o'clock. Cindy, is it possible for you to join us and we'll get the little round table started? Good, good to have you back. And thank again, you. Julie, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate it quite a bit. Um, this is also a chance to pick up on some questions that we didn't have a chance to get to. And I saw one came on kind of late and I see Cindy's going to uh, volunteer to answer that. Cindy? Yes, thank you, Susan, for asking this important question. The question about if your pet can't get a vaccination or you don't have vaccinations, will you be unable to find emergency housing for your pet? I can guarantee you that private boarding facilities are really going to want to have proof that your pet is vaccinated, mainly because it's the herd health situation that you know ensures that all the other pets that are in that facility will remain safe. However, any animal shelter or emergency shelter that's set up for pets, we are not gonna require anything. In fact, it's very likely that your pet may receive a vaccination <clears throat> incoming. So if you don't want your pet uh, or your pet can't be vaccinated, that's something to bring to our attention immediately. But all pets are served regardless of their vaccination status or history or anything. We have 
really creative ways to make things happen one way or another. But it, it is good to keep your pets vaccinations updated if you can. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Cindy. You know, this is when we do the roundtables, a good opportunity to kind of hear personal stories. So does anybody want to come up and you two, Roberta, and talk about something that uh, sort of a real life incident that you were involved in that uh, people might be interested in? Doesn't even have to be related to pets necessarily, but that'd be the best. Well, um, I just want to toss out a couple of things. I, I learned a lot. Thank you, Julie, by the way, with regard to the larger animals. I learned so much and I'm sure others have. So thank you. But I was really um, interested when you highlighted the fact that don't put anything combustible in your trailers because of the embers. And people need to realize if you wait until it's like really late in an incident, <clears throat> you might be driving through an ember storm. So keeping those windows up, yeah. the, the you know your trailers closed, and not having combustible materials in the in the trailer, I'm like, wow, that's a good point. I hadn't really thought about that. It, it's thanks, Roberta. It, sometimes it's the small things, like everything in life. It's those little. It's all in the details, and that could be um, a huge lifesaver. You could be leaving early enough, but there's ember cast from you know a fire that's over a mile away. If your windows in your trailer are open, or you have a stock trailer like we do, but you've got hay or shavings or straw on the floor, you're uh, you're a, a, a hazard at 60 miles an hour waiting to stir up uh, flames. So it's really a big one. Yeah, Cindy, you've been to a lot of shelter uh, experiences. Tell us a little bit more about that. Oh boy, you know, I, I could talk for hours on it. There have been some really amazing life lessons learned, some bad scenarios I've been in, you know, uh, hairy situations long ago when safety wasn't a priority as it is nowadays. But I, I think one of the fascinating things that I always love to be a part of and to help coordinate are the reunion of lost cats. When disaster strikes, especially with wildfires, cats have this amazing ability to somehow survive. When we think all hope is gone for their survival, they will find a sewer pipe, a little deck under crossing. So many cats survive fires really well, despite what we think otherwise. And so, you know, just really trying to reiterate to people, never stop looking for your missing pet. What happens with cats, interestingly enough, is they just hide out literally for weeks. So we might not see them once all the activity of fire response is done. We might not see them start coming out for like three to four weeks after the fire. And so sometimes that takes people off guard when they go to only, you know, burnt remains with nothing out left here they hear a little meow and out comes fluffy you know so those are my favorite stories that i hold dear to my heart as well as the number of people we've helped by going in to get their pets for them and just the relief factor but well, yeah it's a, it's a hard one well, can, that's can, good. I, can i sure. share a story yeah. about um the 2017 fires very quickly so um, so we do live in Glen Ellen in Sonoma Valley, and um, the Nuns Fire broke out very suddenly on a neighboring property about 300 yards from our back door. And at that time, we had nine equines, we had a bunch of cats, mostly outdoor cats, barn cats. Um, we had dogs and we had people on the ranch. That fire was on us before anyone knew there was a fire. I am not by any, any means uh, a, a pro with the long careers of Cindy and Roberta. I only got into this in 2013, but between 2013 and 2017, I had a lot of training. I had joined and trained with one of the uh, top um, animal disaster response teams in the country. And I pretty much knew what to do. We had a plan. We were pretty well prepared. We're better prepared now, but we were able to move all our animals and ourselves and our equipment, our, our rigs, to our shelter in place location on our ranch because there were no options. There was no way out. Um, and we did that in seven minutes. So I just want to say to people that I've walked the walk. So another thing that I'd love to be able to share is the importance of having those out of town contacts. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no communication during the early days of that fire. And 
On the third or fourth evening, as my husband and I were eating our luscious dinner of power bars and water in our barn, looking out at flames across the valley, I suddenly got a text message. I had not received any communications for a day and a half, and it was from Marin Humane. I'll probably cry when I say this. <laughs> and um, our friends, Cindy Machado and Nancy McKinney, from their command center in Marin, where they had the ability to see the news and be in touch with emergency services, knew what was going on, got in touch with us. And the importance of having those contacts, of knowing people and being able to rely on them to be in touch with you and your loved ones, or even make that call to request help or services for your animals it is one of the most important, valuable things that you can do. And, um, and Roberta, same, same to you. So these are two people who really have the backs of the community and there are more like them. We can't do it alone, but we need our community members to really step up. We are blessed that there's so much great planning and preparedness and drilling going on, but <clears throat> don't stop. Keep practicing, have a plan, do it. Great. Well, it pays off. Julie <laughs> brings up some really good points there. And yeah, we were really worried about you and the ranch. And uh, it was frantic trying to get a hold of you. But I think that's the other part is don't wait to receive the call, make the call. You know, we were in touch with our colleagues, Sonoma County Animal Services during that fire actually had to evacuate their animal shelter, if you can, if you can believe that. And so, you know, we carry our colleagues' cell phones handy. We're all communicating in a disaster. And the other trend that we're seeing is we are probably going to be pushing people out of Marin and Sonoma County altogether in a big event. We, we learned that the hard way here in Marin. Um, and so we, we love the fact of finding out of the area places because we think that's the reality in the years ahead. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, I... Julie, I'm so for seven minutes you got everything done. That's really spectacular. It shows the importance of pre-planning and practicing going through the motions. I wish we could get and knowing your animals, as Cindy yeah. pointed out, also knowing your animals. Yeah, have a plan and have a backup plan and have another plan. That was our plan C, actually. Yeah. So yeah. and even if you don't have animals, that's we'd be thrilled if families could get something going mm -hmm. in seven minutes. So that's just uh, that's great. Uh, we did, partly through the program one time, we did a little bit of poll. There are a couple of interesting things. Our audience is very well prepared. A hundred percent of them have a plan. In advance. So that's a pretty impression. 90% uh, awesome. of them have a go bag for their pet already. Wow. Oh, that's a pain. great job. Uh, a lot of, a lot of cat family uh, lovers out there. So I think Cindy's stories about cat survivability probably really struck a chord with everybody, you know. So there was a, we have a very prepared and engaged audience of that. So that's, that's, that's really encouraging. And I think that's a testimony to the work that you're all doing out there to get the message out to everybody. No, we can't do it alone. It yeah. takes all of us. And I have one real quick question slash comment, I think, and maybe Julie, you can help me with this. So, you know, I've been encouraging people with RVs and large trailers like horse trailers to think about leaving early, you know, when you get the red flag warning or certainly when yeah. you get an evacuation advisory before you get the order because you really don't want to be dragging that large trailer no. or driving that big RV, you know, when you get the evacuation order. Is that practical? Am I telling people the right thing? No, you absolutely. It's knowing when to go. And when you are evacuating with large animals and older people on walkers and wheelchairs, and little babies in strollers, you need to leave when that weather alert or when that watch, the minute there is a hint that you could be in pretty serious danger and roads are going to be closed, roads are going to be congested, power is going to be out, there will be no gas at the gas stations, the driving conditions could be horrible, the shelters are going to fill up, that's too late. You're just creating a, a, a tsunami of additional challenges for yourself. So it is tricky, it is a
Yeah. 22 because when you are evacuating early, there are no emergency shelters opened yet, which is why you need your personal resource network of places to go out of the area. <laughs> you know, the other part to that is get to safety however you can and the rest will follow. So we hear often, you know, evacuation points versus evacuation shelters. Yeah. We just want you out and safe and then we'll deal with all of the logistics of day to day life. But you know, with technology and the weather reporting features we have nowadays, I'm a big fan of the alert uh, wildfire cameras. So when there's the hint of a problem, I'm on those cameras watching, I'm watching the wind. It's a lot of technology we can use well in advance of those um, alerts. And I agree And rely Julie. on the trusted messengers. Don't go to your <laughs> Facebook friends. Stick with the agency, stick with Marie, <clears throat> stick with uh, the Office of Emergency Services and the mm -hmm. sheriff and your local fire resources and the FEMA alerts uh, and, and alert Marin and SoCo alerts. Everybody's yep. is a little bit different and don't rely on just one, sign up for everything. <laughs> so know who to trust, know where to go, know when to go and um, go early. Well, we're almost out of time, and we had some takeaway slides prepared, which we didn't have a chance to get to. I wanted to give each one of the three of you a chance to leave the audience with just one last takeaway. Cindy, you want to start? Yeah, mine is going to be emphasizing identification, whether it's your pet ID tag, microchipping. There's no reason we can't do that, and that's going to help us get your pet back to you really quickly. Great. And Julie? Julie? Mine is going to be be very realistic about the realities of the animals that you have and what they are going to be able to do safely and plan to make the safest possible place and plans for them, whether it's evacuating or sheltering in place. Thank you. Roberta? Yeah, my, my big recommend is get comfortable with doing the evacuation. Practice it have your plan, practice your plan, get used to doing it. So when the event happens, you're not like freaking out going, wow, what do I do? Shoot, have your list, have your go bag, just be very, very comfortable. I think you should be as comfortable evacuating as you are, you know, spontaneously saying, hey, let's go to the beach, throw everything together and you run to the beach. <laughs> it should be that comfortable. If you're uh, calm, your animals are going to be calm. There we go. That's yep. a good one. Well, on that note, um, for tons of information tonight, just fantastic. This is recorded. You find it on our YouTube channel mm -hmm. out there. So this is one I'm actually going to be looking at again myself. And then we'll be breaking it down and using this for lots of things. So I really want to thank Cindy and Julie so much. We just really appreciate taking the time. And Roberta, it was great having a co-host. Wonderful having you here. We'll have to do more of this. Makes yeah. it kind of fun. That was great. Um, and then for the audience, I just remind you that uh, next month's webinar will be on insurance. Um, it's, it's boring until you lose it <laughs> or you get denied coverage or all these other things happen. So the three people who are speaking are really very expert. You'll, you'll get a lot of it. And then um, August will be very different because we'll be working with the folks from Rin Center for Independent Learning. There's a lot we can all learn from, from them and from the experiences of people with access and functional needs who are really our most vulnerable population during disaster. So we're very engaged with them. And I think, uh, I think they have a lot to teach us and a lot that we can learn from them that um, will be very helpful for everybody. So that being said, once again, thanks to our guests and behind the scenes, thanks to everybody at FireSafe Marin who makes all this possible. And we'll see you uh, all next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Thank you.